Elazar. It's a very um, uh, language. It says, Actually, Nivra Olam, prior to the creation of the world, Hayazar was who is himself, Ushmo and his name. Actually, the gears are found over there in the picture of Elazar is Ushmo Agadol and his great name, Bilvad. Now, the truth of the matter is, if you know the Girsis are Gura, and I just want to notice it for, for the Gura in the picture has a different Girsa based on the Zayra Chadash and Parshat Bereshis, where it says there's something else. It says, Ayahu Ushmo Echad. So one is Ahu Ushmo Levad, he and his name alone, or he and his name were one. Now, they mean two separate things. I want to try to explain this. What does it mean, Ayahu Ushmo Bilvad? And as the Rebbe says, Lechorai no Muvan, this doesn't make too much sense. What's the idea of having a name or a description? What's a name? A name is a description, okay? I, I make certain sounds. That's the way I communicate with you. Should you be totally alone, um, and it would be only one-dimensional, uh, would you need to describe yourself? Would there be a necessity? Would there be any meaning of having a name? Totally meaningless. Name is an idea. is the way you communicate, the way you yourself outside of yourself. I mean, uh, do I need my name for myself? Well, I'm multidimensional, so I would say that my I need my name to understand the essence of my soul, if I would understand that. I remember once going to, this week was the Yorchid of the Baba Sali, Rabbi Sol Abu Chatzira, last week. I remember going once to visit him. He had a house next to our Kola. So during the break, I went to see him. There were two Belzer Hasidim, there two little, you know, these guys, the ethnic type. And they went, they asked the Rebbe, um, can you tell us the root of our neshama, the shavish and neshama? They want to understand the essence of their names. These little boys. So he had to listen, you learn a lot of Gemara, you'll know yourself. <laughs> that, that, that was the answer. First, do me a favor. In other words, get off my case. Learn a lot of Gemara first, and then we'll worry about the rest of it. So really, I mean, I only need it the most to know my shavish and neshama because I'm, I have different dimensions of myself. But God, in essence, is infinite. Infinity, by definition, has no description. It has no description. There are no words that can describe it. No words can call it by a name. What is the meaning of God having a name prior to creation? It makes no sense. So, Lemaise, the Rambam, actually, in Murray Nebuchim, in in Perik Samach Aleph, Rice that I'll quote him said, Koshmo Tavitale Ham Suim Basparim Kulam Nixarim Apulot. All the names of God that we have are nothing more than a derivatives coming from verbs. You say Tzvaka, a Kael. So Kael is the idea of fortitude, strength, Elim, uh, people with a lot of strength. We're talking about, yes, he, he does things with a lot of fortitude. Or, for example, Elohim. Elohim is the idea of a, a, what's a Lord. Lording, Lord, uh, dominating, uh, putting down the law. It's the idea of how we interact with someone else. Uh, uh, svakot. What does kelt svakot mean? He who, who, with fortitude, leads multiple complex realities. Svakot is the idea of of complex uh, uh, realities. Ramban says this. Svakot tzivay sashem. It means the host. It doesn't mean the army. You would say tzava doesn't have to mean the army. When we talk about tzava, we use it in the army. But the army is a complex reality of merging of different peoples and making them work in a cohesive way, doing different things. But reality, tzava doesn't always mean by its ba'u, spiv, mishkan. They convene together around the mishkan, which means, say, the Ramban says, many people of different stripes and colors joined together in a group around the mishkan. That doesn't have to mean that they were in the military service. So we have to understand that Kelt Svakot means the God who leads multiple complex realities. That's what it means when you say Kelt Svakot, the force which leads uh, the, this, this, this unbelievably colorful reality that we have here. That's what Kelt Svakot means. So these are all names describing God in interaction. It's because that these names can end with a Nun Yuvav at the end, L-O-K Nu etc. It's my God, because it's a name dealing with God in interaction with me and with the world around me. Elokeinu, Elokai, Elokeichem, etc. These are words who shayach lanu. But there's one name which doesn't have any, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't come from any verb, doesn't describe any interaction, that is Yud and Hey and Vav and Hey. 
that name doesn't really uh, describe God in interaction at all. Uh, what is that name of God? That name of God, so I mentioned last week, a show, last week, a show law, it's basically a Ramban, but the Ramban writes that what does the name of Yud Kevav Ke mean? Well, there's two explanations I can tell you right now. First of all, there is the explanation of the Tanya in his um, second volume called Shara Yichud Ve'emunah, where he explains Lehavot means to bring into existence. Yud with a hove afterwards, a, a word hove, hey vav hey, which means bring in the havot to bring into existence. I need present, hove is present. To the havot is to bring into the present, equals bring into existence. The yud preceding for that word, uh, tiny is based on a pusik in Iyov, when the Iyov, where the pus the pusik says, Kacha Yaase Iyov, and all the interpreters will explain yet when the yud is before the verb, means it's a constant. Yeah, Asami, he is constantly doing. Yud, with the hey of hey, means say, the God who is constantly bringing into reality. Is what we say, that we, as the Rabbi writes, the world exists because he constantly wants it to exist. So he's constantly bringing it into reality. That is the God of creation, not the God prior to creation. So that can't be Kodim Shinivra Ha'olam. <laughs> The God of creating existence. So therefore, it's God which creates existence. That is Yud K. Babka. So if that's the case, that's also not the name of infinity. It's only the name. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, what does it mean that God is, is what is this name of God? Which is the, uh, the Ramban says it's slightly different. The Ramban explains that Yud K. Babka means the primary existence. Even he who in essence, there's no reason for him. He's just there. And everything comes forth from him by his will and by his omnipotence. This is what God is. God is the primary existence. What we're doing is not describing him in essence, but describing him from our uh, understanding of existence, which is relative. I say relative because the truth of the matter is everything that exists in this beautiful world of science has a cause. And the reason it exists is due to the cause. And for example, if the cause is a measured cause, which will only last for 10 years, you will cease to exist after 10 years. Why do our bodies deteriorate from year on? I'm not going into it. Read the end of Kohelet. It tells you all about it. I'm at the age, okay, where your bodies start deteriorating. Get used to it. We start eating health foods and working out and walking. Yeah, I got news for you. It's a time bomb. That's the, read the end of Kohelet. He says exactly what happens. I never saw a psukim, which is so real and vivid. It's quite a frightening experience. I don't enjoy hearing it on, on Kolomai Tsukas, because he spells it out for you. Read it. Okay, it says what it said. The things start, start grounding, grinding, and aching, and they don't work anymore. It's a rough, but that's the way it is. Thank God if you live in a world of seichel, so you don't care. So, Adir Abba, you know, the goof is a little less dominant, so there's more time to think. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, why is that way? Because the programming of the, bi the biological clock is built for X amount of time, with X, which can carry X amount of stress, etc. You can live the healthiest lifestyle at the end of the day. Your motion may say, I'm shivim shona vim shama. Average age is something like upper 80s today. Thank God for that. So I still have a few more years to go. But at the end, you know, it's no joke. I have a conversation with someone this week dealing with what's with Kirby Yavna and the day after. I said, are you serious? Yeah, Rabbi, we got to think about the day after. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Like, relax on me. This is one of these great board members who calls me up to talk to you about the, what are we going to do the day after? No, but we're in denial. But there is a day after because your cause is limited. Your, your biological cause is limited. You're not made. You're like these machines. They last for 10 years and then it goes like a car, for goodness sakes. So your cause is limited. Therefore, your existence is limited to the effectivity and the amount that you have in your cause. But God is there forever because there's no reason for him to be. He is a hovet kadmon. He's the primary existence. He has no cause. Therefore, he has no effect. Therefore, he has no end. He has no beginning. He has no end. Uh, I explained in the previous year why is it that in Hasidus and in Kabbalah we call the enlightening of the God's capability of enlightening the world and man is called Oyer Ein Sof, the light, the source, source of infinite light. 
it never ends. What about never beginning? And the answer is no. The fact that God enlightens, that's a very verb describing God with an I thou relationship. We have to enlighten something outside of himself. Well, for that, it has a beginning. Whenever God wanted to create duality, therefore, he is the source of light, which starts there and never ends, granted. But it doesn't mean to say, but there's no beginning. The only thing which has no beginning is the essential infinite God. And that clearly cannot have a name. So Hove Kadmon is only describing not what he was. We today perceive that. So does it mean there was a name before? No, that also doesn't make sense. It didn't have a name before. He was that before. Uh, Hoveka always was. Granted. But why, what's the idea of Shmo HaGadol and his name? Why say that? That, only, that the idea of name only happened post-creation. This is a serious problem. Um, the Radal, David Luria, the big uh, Talmud, uh, Talmud, uh, Talmud Talmud of the Talmud of Remendel Shklover, which is basically the Talmud of the Gra, uh, he writes, it means, Kodim Shinivraha Olam, means to say before God created uh, duality, but began the process of creation. I will explain myself. The process of creation is very similar to how you and me think, speak, and finally act. And here I'll explain myself. You have the basic capability of thought. You then take your capability of thought when you're thinking an idea, you create it into symbolism. You have a capability of thought, which is pure kinetic energy. You have a capability of conceptualizing and thinking. But in order to think a thought, you have to put symbol. You, you have no way of thinking without doing it through symbolism. You create illustrations that you picked up from your experience of life. And you make those illustrations your ideas. Your ideas have letters, words, pictures to them. That's what these things are. You don't think without oisios. You think we're actually medaber beliboy, by yedaber belibo. We have Haman speaking to his heart. It doesn't mean he was mumbling like an old man which talks to himself. We used to have a rabbi in Tabi why used to do that, talk to himself. No. It means to say he thinks with oisios. That's the medaber beliboy. He thinks sentences. He doesn't just. There's symbolism there, okay? So your first stage is pure thought, ultimately translated into symbolism, which is thought. Then the third stage is actually speech. Now you take those letters and actually you, 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 give, you, you talk them, you give them, what are you doing when you speak? Did you ever think what you're doing? You're giving your words independence. And as your first idea, the capability of thought is purely you. You're one with yourself. And one of the word I includes my capability of thinking. The idea of afterwards taking um, external symbols that you picked up through life and experience and using them to frame your ideas, that's already in introducing something external of yourself into yourself to think. So you're thinking. But when you're thinking, you understand what you're thinking, I hope. Uh, and, um, and, and, and it can't be misconstrued because only what you think is what is there. No one can misinterpret my thoughts. They're not privy to them. I'm, to, for me to misinterpret my thoughts, I would probably uh, be a doctor if that would be possible. Uh, it's like a Jekyll Hyde uh, split personality. I don't think a priest pe person doesn't understand his thoughts, okay? Especially when it's Oisio Yisadiba, you create the symbolism. Whatever you put in them, that's what it is. But when you speak, what are you doing? You are now expressing that symbolism externally and what you're doing is you're giving independence of existence. At this stage, you can die or think the opposite. Those words are there. And those words are now can impact other people and can and will be understood by other people. And as an old teacher of 50 years, I can say in 90% of the time, they will be misconstrued. They will not understand exactly what my thoughts are. Because every person is going to take those words and translate them according to his own cultural baggage. Ultimately, um, wow. I hear things that I said, which I never dreamt about. I, I'll never forget it. I had a student, which is a professor in a certain university south of the Mason-Dixon, printed a beautiful paper and quoted me at length. And I called him up and said, listen, Mr. X, I hate to say it. This isn't what I said. This is Tvira. This is heresy. He says, Rebbe, you said it. God help me. If I said it, I'm going to burn in hell like you. I mean, for goodness sake. But you said it. Oh, that's what the Mishnah says. Be careful when you say things because they will be misconstrued. It's the truth. They're constantly misconstrued. Every time I walk out of Shiva, I have 30 opinions of what I said, and none of them reflect what I meant. 
The Gemara says, you only understand your teacher after 40 years. God help me. I understand that very well. After 40 years, I have these guys call me up seven, eight years later. Oh, Rebbe, that shit that you said, you actually were right. <laughs> you know, thank God. You know, after he's learned this for another many years, now I came to the conclusion that what I told him then when he was an 18-year-old pumpkin was actually accurate. It, of course it takes some time to think. It's to be understood. So in other words, when you speak, you're giving your thoughts. In, your, your thoughts, they don't know. Your words have independence with now. God knows that they will even reflect your thoughts. It's totally independent. If the guy is a good listener, then he will see your thoughts in those words. But on the other hand, he can misconstrue it. So what you've done is created a totally different reality. And then there's obviously how people inter that's oh, that's that, the last part of the process is doing things, not just saying things, but actually taking those thoughts and making a difference and an impact with them. You can talk things, but afterwards, practically, you give advice to a certain prime minister of what to do in Gaza the day after. If he listens, if that happens, wow, your thoughts were actually implemented. Now, if you look carefully in the creation, it's very much the same. Uh, there is God uh, 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 thinking. Uh, and those thoughts are nothing more than they're, they're him and in himself. Now, God does not think in symbolism, which he external, internalizes from outside of him. He thinks in symbolism, which he expresses from himself. God is wise and has thoughts before he created the world. He thought. What did he think? He thought in his symbolism. Great. That symbolism is number one. And that is also some kind of a creation. He created something. He expressed himself within himself. That can't be, that doesn't mean he gave his thoughts independence. When metaphorically God spoke, what does that mean? It means that those thoughts, which are nothing more than his thoughts, now he created a sense of independence. That's when you say God created the world by thought, it means he created a reality which is totally, can be seen only as him within himself. Like I feel, I think. And then there's God which speaks. Which means that I created my thoughts now have a sense of independence. Hello, God created the world. You have a sense of independence. You therefore look at the world and misconstrue it and see, totally see it through something which has nothing to do with God's thoughts. You don't even see God or his thoughts in it. You see a world. You give it independence. And then there's finally the realities which are there. So when we look at this, you say, I ask myself, when it says, what does it mean? You know what it means? It means this is what, what the writer of David Luria writes. Question of is prior to creating Bria. Bria means duality. Prior to God expressing himself, giving a sense of independent identity outside of that, there was God creator. Yes, first he created his, his interactive persona. His interactive persona is the God of thought, the God that can't speak, the God can do a million things. The God has ideas. The guy which has ideas, but he didn't express them. The guy who has ideas is already is an interactive God, which has a chachma, a bina, and a das, and he's thinking, but didn't say anything yet. The Bria starts with Amira. Yes, Beresh is Bora Elohim. Bora means duality. Bora means external. Puk Tani Libra, the Gemara calls a Brita. Teach it outside of the normal course of the base medrash. It's like extracurricular. That's brighter, outside. A son is called a derivative outside of the father. He's called bra. Bra kare davua. The father, the son is perceived as the as as the as, as the, the feet of the uh, 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 of the father. Okay. That's an external reality. So we talk about uh, so we talk about kaidim shenivra elok. I mean, before God created duality, Bereshit, Bora Elohim, Esashamayim, Vesoris. He created something outside of himself. That's what you have. Do you have already Hashem Elohim? And there's before that Bora, before there was Elohim, which, act, which acted in constriction, there was the source of it, means God creator. That's Kanjan Nivra Elam. It only starts by Elam Ha'atzilus equals. When the God first emanated within himself an interactive persona, which would be a potential creator.
So that would explain what it means here when it says, Achille Nivra Oilo, that's how David Luria explains this in uh, Goes to the Sefer uh, Pirkid Rebeleza. Now let's see what the Tzemach Tzedek says. A very similar idea, but typically different. And he said, I'm going to look at it again, the 12th line. On Facebook, it doesn't make sense. What is the idea of having a name? The question is fair. Before there was Bria, what did he need the name for? We're describing what it was before the Nivrayan book. That's just our description post-creation. What is the idea of a name prior to Bria? What, what, what would that be for? It's for himself. He for himself still he doesn't need a name. What does it mean? There was him and his name prior to Bria. I can say that I today can describe the situation uh, but Silus prior to Bria as Yudke Vavke. That's today, but that's not Kodim Shinivra Oilam Hayah Shmo Hagadol Bavad. And what does it mean according to the Gura? Shmo Hagadol Echad. What does this mean? So let's see what it says. Shashem no Rakhlishu Korobo. A name is only that which someone outside of him calls him Abifne at Shmo. In Sechim Lishem, you don't need a description. There is a, what's the, what, there could be a description, but you don't need it. He's, 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 he's agrees. You could describe it as Yud Kevavke from Atzilus before Bria, but why would it be needed? Why do you say it existed prior to that? Since it was then prior to creation, nothing outside of him except for he himself equals even at the level of Atzilus, of emanation, where he already had an interactive persona. What's that? Who's going to call him by that name? Nobody. So what was the necessity of saying that there was that name? This is his question. So he's basically skirting the Ravdal, saying, granted, Rabbi David Luria, I understand there's the possibility of a name, but what the um for? Why does the Chazal have to say there was a name? There was the potential that we will call afterwards by a name, but that, at the time there was no reason to call by a name. So why do you think there was Shema Agadol prior to the Bria? According to the Gishas of Gerard, it's even more interesting. The Shem Agadol was totally in one with God. What does that mean? Why, why do you call the Shem before in oneness? What do you need, what's the idea of having a Shem? There seems to be something there which is defined prior to, to Bria. What for? So it goes like this. The Yuvandus will be understand, understood. That which is found in the Pasik, we all know this Pasik. You say this, you hear this in the time of Sibur. Now, normally, how do we understand that? My thinking is not yours. You have no clue of what I want. That's a low machshvotai machshvotichem. My thoughts are not yours. Below that, gechem derachai, and my and my path of activity is not your path of activity. No, we understand that we don't have the key to history. We don't know why God does anything. Ramam doesn't learn it that way. Ramam learns what's the machshavatay machshavatichem. When I say I think, it doesn't mean what you people think. You think we did this in the past. You internalize external phenomena and make it into mental images and you think it. As opposed to, oh, Daniel, hi. He's in Israel today. Uh, but but uh, God, he does not internalize external phenomena. Rather, he expresses himself in thought. We discussed this in the past. But the, here, the Ramak, Moshe Kadavero explains something else. The Ramak, this is found in uh, in, uh, uh, in Sefer Apardes. You want to look it up. It's in Shah Yud Aleph. Okay? So the Ramak writes that Kavana, the intent of this Pasuk is, he named Machsheves Basav Adam. The thought process, the thinking of, of flesh and blood equals the, 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 the uh, human uh, or even the created form, Hevalu. It actually has no consistency and it doesn't last nothing happens when you think except for within yourself nothing changes you, you, you thought the aim ben mo'il it's not it has no uh there's no nothing that it is good for nothing can be created from your thoughts the only thing we create from your thoughts is speech that's the first stage or action but the thought itself is nothing more than the, I would say, the, the first pro, first the first stage of a process. After you think, then you can express it by doing, by saying, by doing whatever you want. 
you can think about something endlessly for hours. Lo yuchal lo sif or v'chayuba davar ahu. You're not going to give any more illumination, any, any more godliness by thinking about something. Nothing's going to change anything just by thinking about something. This, this thing exists not because of your thought. If your thought would be something which is the reason, a cause of its reality, then you will change it by thinking. These are people that somehow believe, these yogis believe, by focusing on peace, this will bring peace to the world. You, know, you, ever, see, you ever see these things? They get together on a mountaintop somewhere in your area, you know, Los Angeles over there, by Bear Mountain, they get, or they go to Boulder. You know, they go to Boulder. You know, in Boulder, you have like, these retreats. It's really beautiful. We get together, hold hands, and you think you're going to levitate. You know, with great respect, it ain't happening. Okay? So you have to say, Machshavah Zmei Adam, don't energize much. You have these things, give positive energy by thinking, and this activates people. Yeah, maybe, you know, another million. It doesn't work, you know, physics doesn't accept this. So here he says, the remark says that you can think about something forever, nothing will change, because your thoughts are not uh, the reason of this being. Uh, when are your machshava do something when it was realized by what? By by doing something. You know, speaking is also doing it, I'd say. That's true by people. So your machshava is nothing more than the raw material, which can come to the next stage. But at the moment, the level of machshava, you haven't really created or done anything. We think about the process of thinking of God. This has to be understood. In one thought, God created all of reality. This goes to a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. The Mishnah says in Pirkei Avot, Basara Mamarot The man was created, the world was created by ten major expressions. Okay, we know that. Okay. And the mission says, couldn't the world be created in one mamar, in one expression? Yes. So why does God need 10? It's a bit of a weird mishnah, you know what I mean? When, and 10 is enough. I thought it was 365. I don't know what, how many different, uh, you know, it seems to be that with one word, he created a hell of a lot of things, right? Think of it, all the molecules, all the atoms, all, all the cells, all that. There's so many things he created with one word. I mean, Yehi Rakia, wow, you know what I mean? Just try to understand the science of the different spheres. You can get dizzy, and that's all done with one word, Yehi Rakia. Okay? So if that's the case, you could have created the whole world that way. <laughs> what is the idea of one world, one, 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 one thing? What does it mean, one world? The mission asked, well, if that's the case, why create 10? So obviously the 10 is an idea of making a fractured world, of a world which somehow is not in unison, and therefore, over there, it's fractured. Ten is the number of when you take different decimals, and ultimately, they do come back to one. Right? You moved away from singulars into into des into tens. Okay, you already grouped them back again. But Sarama Maro says, "I made a fractured world which can be put together into one again." That's actually what it means. Okay, so why is the idea of making a fractured world and then putting it back into one? But that Sakhar, that Sadiqim, that they actually find the unifying factor in these numbers to make that those one the, those decimals into a good old number. Okay? And the Sakhar, and the opposite for Rishoyim, that they thrive over the fractured reality and they don't bother trying to put it all together into one to fulfilling the will of God. This is the idea of the mission. So what does he say here? He says, um, world was created, not it could have been, it was created with one thought. And look what he says here. Okay, I want you to understand this is a, my, this is again, this is found in a tzchayim, in Shar Alem. Hmm. The world was created with one machshava. I'll explain in a minute. Hainu machshavas hano emloch. Kemosh ketu be'etz chayim. Eitz Chaim says that the world, world, we'll talk in a minute what the word world means, we discussed it in the past, was created with one thought, even without speaking. There was a thought of God which created reality. When, as it says, when it came up into his infinite mind to build, create the world, the world was created. When it rose in his will, 
the Mivra Alma, to build, create the world, the world was created. So it seems to be the world was created through Ratzon and Machshava. Hinei Ayidei Ratzon Zeh, by will, equals a will expressed in thought, Nisavu Olamot Mamash, Ukmo Shamar, Hu Amar Vayehi. What is that? That doesn't sound like thought. That's Amar Vayehi, by Yomer Elukim. So the Rebbe explains, what is it when the Zohar says that? What does the Zohar explain? Amira doesn't mean Amira. It means Amira Shibboleth. Let's try to understand this again. Obviously, God doesn't have a baritone, and there were no, you know, let there be light. It sounds like Charles the Heston in the Ten Commandments. No, uh, uh, God does not, you know, the, who does he speak to? Was, was there air for vibration? Were there sounds? When you say, let there be light, but let there be a sky, who was he talking to? To himself? Uh, why does he have to talk? What does it mean? These are obviously metaphors. These are obviously metaphors. Meaning that they, God expressed his energies in forms which are creating by speaking a sense of independence. So it means God expressed his will and his wisdom in finite forms, and by speaking them equals he gave them a sense of independence. It means to say he created duality. Okay? But beforehand, he thought in his mind. What do you mean when he thought in his mind? He did not create duality. You thought, just as I said before, you think in symbolism, you create a concrete idea that you didn't create, that God, when he thinks that, created a level of consciousness. There's a level of consciousness which is there created when God did not give it a sense of, uh, of, of, uh, of duality, a sense of independence. And I, let me just read what he says, and I'll explain it carefully. You know, I'll say it orally myself first. Let's start from Allah Beis. The Pasuk says, Bereshit bara lukim et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz. Ba'aretz et ha-tov v'vo v'chosh avnei tahom, v'ruach lukim, etc. Now, how do you read that first Pasuk? Bereshit bara lukim et ha What does the word Bereshit mean? It could mean, it's basically a, it's a, it's a, it's a title to the parsha. In the very beginning, it was before man came around, he built the world. Now we're going to tell you how he did it. First, he said, read the Hirakia, he this, read that. And that's what, you know, originally there was pandemonium, and he started making order. Okay. Your obvious question is when, in other words, there was the first the Big Bang, there was a lot of energy, nothing defined, and then start, God started defining it. But what created energy? How do you read this? Prashit Baral Kimish Mindbasarits. But I would say that tov avo, it was disarray, it was chaotic, right? The Ruch and God's spirit was hovering over this matter. He's talking, literally describing a massive energy, which is a chaotic form. And then God decided to take this massive energy and say, hey, out of this massive energy, make light, make animals, make this, make that, make whatever you want. So primarily, first it was very sheet Baran Lukim, and the original reality he created. Shemaim Baritz, which means it's a pseudonym for the primary matter. This is Ramban al Torah. Ramban said, Breshit Baral Akim at the Shemaim Baritz. Originally, God created what you would call the Big Bang, which you would call the massive energy, okay? What you would call uh, heulic matter equals primary matter. That's what it was. Now, the uh, Ramban understand that uh, Shemaim Baritz are two types of matter. There's the matter from which he formed uh, the uh, the conceptual, uh, I would say, the metaphysical realities, and there is the matter from which he formed the physical realities. The laws of science deal with the trying to understand how we get to the understand the forms of the matter of orits. The, the world of metaphysics is trying to understand the forms of the matter of shamayim. That's what it is. So you understand it, it is what is the primary reality, the metaphysical reality, which ultimately is expressed in the physical reality as Ramban elaborates in Parshas Bereshis. Everything in Oritz is an expression of what is in Shammai. Okay? Lashon of the Ramban is whatever is happening here is just an expression. It says, desha, it means Ha'aritz Ha'elyona. Okay? Whatever happened in Ha'aritz Ha'elyona, that expresses the finally in the grass in my garden in Teaneck. I don't know wherever I'm living, okay? So, hey, Ben, I met you, Ben. You know, uh, good old Bergenfield, Teaneck, whatever it be. So, um, um, so you understand that's what's happening. So we talk about, we talk about, um, 
<coughs> so that's what Bereshis means. Now, Bereshis, it doesn't say Yehi there. It doesn't say anything. It's just a Bereshit Bara Elohim HaShemayim Barat. Does it say, by Yomer Elohim Yeshemayim Yaharet? No. Where does it start saying by Yomer? Only from after he created the primary matter. Now he started doing his cookie cutter and creating forms in that matter. Yehi Rakia, Yehi Shamayim, Tatsyad Zesha, Nase Adam, Yishritsu Amayim. You know what? These are all words. If you look carefully in the Chumash, there are only nine times by Yomer Yehi. There are no ten Mahamarot. There's only nine Mamarot. You read your Chumash, there are nine Mamarot of Ayomer Yehi. There are all the Mamarot, what he did with the primary matter. The primary matter is not created through Amira. The primary matter equals is something which is created by Amira Shabalei. When Chazal say Asar Mamarot, it means one Mamar is Amira Shabalei. And that is something which can't be misconstrued because you actually don't even understand what that primary matter is. <laughs> How can you misconstrue it? You, it's basically God expressing himself in Atsilus. Yes, he expressed himself. And this is what you would call the, the beginnings of everything, what you would call the source, that, that, that's the source of it all. Now, that primary matter afterwards is cookie cutter. And what you're looking at uh, by Yoimar is means that I'm giving this type of form and it has its own identity and therefore capability of misconstruing. I'm getting this form which has its own reality and can be misconstrued. I'm making a world, a cosmos full of forms which you can interpret it and literally not see me there. <laughs> you can mis like you can, go to, you can say over my sheer and totally deny my existence. You can say the opposite of what I meant. You can look at the world and deny the professor. That's called the world of speech. That is only post the primary matter. The primary matter can't be misconstrued. The primary matter is the creation when it's still yet given independence. That's called osios hamachshava, the world of thought. Just as my thought, when the thought is mine, no one can misconstrue my thoughts because no one knows them except for me. And I know what I'm thinking. But as soon as I give them expression, I give them free, I give them freedom. I'm sending them off every time I say it. Rabbi Nachman says that before you teach Torah, you should cry a lot. He says why? Because when you teach Torah, understand it's going to be terribly misconstrued, and you really have to pray that it shouldn't be terribly misconstrued. He said that the chat in the puzzle Al Narod Babel. at the rivers. You know, Torah is called water. The rivers of knowledge. Al Narod Babel. At the source of the knowledge of Talmud Bavli, Sham Yashavnu, the rabbi said, Gam Bachinu, did they cry a lot before they wrote this down? Because, wow, is it being misconstrued? Woohoo! <laughs> In a terrible way. Sham Yashavnu, Gam Bachinu. You have to cry. So he says, you have to cry a lot and pray a lot that your Torah should somehow be understood. I understand that's the feeling that I say every day. Lil Might is easy. Lalame, are you kidding? That's like, it, it, it's an impossible feat. How am I supposed to get into these pumpkins' minds that can really understand an abstract thought? It's like sometimes drives you crazy. You have to like literally talk pygmy language for them to understand an idea. I feel I'm Aesop's fables. I'm telling profound ideas in storybook form. And they're only going to catch the storybook form. They're not going to catch the idea. It take 20 years from now, they'll understand the idea. I told you, they call me up years later. You were right. This is what this is. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the uh, the world of thought equals yes. The world was created through thought, in a you would call it in the metaphysical reality, in the primary short reality there, in the form prior to the individualism and cookie cutting. Why did God want that? Why couldn't? Why wasn't God happy with just creating a world of pure oneness? The answer is because that's what he wants. <laughs> he wants you to live a fractured reality with a sense of independence and willing to see the pure oneness of God in it all. That's the job. Okay, so this is what the Rebbe writes. Now let's see it inside. Rebbe writes, 
we're on the last four lines of the page, the last four words of that fourth line from the bottom going up. This is the idea found in the uh, in the mimer of in the uh, in the verse of Chazal. What's this? The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, page thirty-two uh, A. The Gemara says a kasha. The Gemara says. Uh, the world was created with ten mamarot. And the Gemara says, no, there's only nine. The Gemara says, Breshit nami mamarhu. Breshit is also a mamar. It says, Breshit, where is it? Where's the mamar? It's not written. So he says, what does it mean, Breshit nami mamarhu? So what does it mean? It means it's not a mamar of Bayoimar, it's a mamar of Osios Hamach. Shava. So the Rebbe writes, Ruphinat Mamar, Hakolel called Tet Mamaro. That Mamar includes all the, in, in a form of oneness, the total picture of the world. Let me explain. You, know, you think of an architect. An architect has to have an image of what the building is going to look like and how it's going to function. Then you give it to the specialist. So you're the plumber, you do the plumbing. You're the electrician, you do the electrician. You're the mason, you do the bricklaying. But the architect first has in his mind a vision of the whole thing. And then he can start put, putting it into form. You do the bricks, you do the floors, you do this, you do the electricity. And then finally it comes up, you get the vision is realized, okay? So it's that vision, which is, so to speak, that, that oneness of the world is there in Bereshit. That is not my mark, because that doesn't have a sense of independence. That's God's, meta, the metaphysics of reality. Do this ma'amar, shibamachshava, nishavu ko'a nivrei ma'amash, then they became into existence. Raksha nifra tu, achaka betet ma'amara. Literally, this was the, pri the, the primary matter. Then they were individualized through the nine ma'amara. Umashu tzuchu, okay, now this is the ma'isa also in ma'asha there. The ma'asha there in Rosh Hashanah, Actually, it says this chat also uh, there in the Gemara. I suggest you're looking it up. The Marsha says it over there. He said, beautifully, he also quotes a Gemara. The Gemara says, uh, the famous Gemara that, that, that once a, 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 a Malamed Dardika, the Gemara in Shabbos, Tafkuf Dalid, Ahmed Aleph. The Gemara says that there was a teacher of Alephes which came to town and he was teaching things in public. People came to Yeshua and they told the whoop. This guy sees you things we haven't heard since Sinai. What did he say? He was explaining the meaning of the Alephes. And he says, Mem, mem Ptucha Mamar Patuach. Mem Satum, the closed Mem, you know, you have the end Mem, that the closed Mem, Mamar Satum. And that's all it said. There's Mamar Patuach and Mamar Satum. What does it mean, Mamar Patuach and Mamar Satum? So the Marsha there says exactly what the Rebbe writes over here. The Marsha says, Mamar Satum means the idea of the everything is enclosed in one. That's the gracious in the Oishis HaMachshava. That's the, the, the unification of all ideas. And then there's Mamar Patuach. That is the idea of, uh, of creating something which you can decide to see the truth in the circle or you can walk out of it. The Gemara says in Menachas that uh, I'll give an example. When we see an open space in a letter, what does it mean? The Gemara says, why is it that in the letter hay, the yud is hanging? Why don't they stick the um, the yud and the hay to the top, to the end, the bottom of the dalit? Why is it hanging in the middle, in limbo? Look at it. Visualize a hay. It's a dalit with a yud hanging. So it says, you know what it's for? That, you know, first of all, if you want to run away from it, you just fall down. <laughs> An open space means allowing you to misconstrue, to walk away. So then if that's the case, why is there an empty spot also on the top? If you want to go back, you have to go back to create a new you. You have to go from the top. It says you can fall whenever you want. When you go back, you have to reconnect to the primary letter. So you take the you and you have to go up above the you. Okay, it means you have to re- Structure your perceptions. That's what the Gemara said. That Gemara teaches me that an open space in a letter equals freedom. The capability of walking away from the idea. Misconstruing. A closed letter, like men, 
is a nice way of saying, no, man, that's what it is. That This is the circle, and you're in the middle of it. That's what it is. There's nothing else. So the mem stuma, a closed mem, mamar satum. It is the closed mimer. What is the closed mimer? The closed mimer equals closed into the thoughts of God and not in expression of, of speech of God equals bereshit, mamar satum. The oneness of the world prior to creation of duality. Those who attain that, they look at the metaphysics of the world, they look at the truth behind things, they realize there's nowhere to go and you can't walk away from it if you want to. And there's no meaning of anything outside of it. And then there's Mamar Patuach. Yeah, there's animals, there's grass, there's everything. Do what you want with it. Misconstrue it. Deny it. And this is literally what the Gemara says, that the Marsha says, Mamar Satum is Bereshit Nama Mamaru. Mamar Patuach are the nine mamarot. And this is the asar mamarot shenibra So the Rebbe here explains, let's go to the last line in this page. Why is it that God created a world of a fractured reality and therefore it had to be separate mamarot of speech? Why couldn't it just exist in a world of the oasis of machshava? It wasn't enough to be tabutam for the coming into existence idea of machshava dana emlech. I'm going to spend that in a minute. Anna Emlech, who, I'm flipping the page, because if the, the creation was nothing to do to the thought of God, they would only have a spiritual metaphysical existence, something which doesn't even have a sense of itself. Way above, beyond where they are now. And God didn't want that. God wants us to slum it. He wants us to find him in the lowest places possible. Okay, I have to explain a certain concept because there's something here which is missing. He says what he describes the um, uh, the, uh, the the machshava of Hakadosh Baruch Hu as one word, Melech. I know I'm loch. I want to be a king. That is basically the machshava of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, which creates everything. Now this is also a marsha. On things, also a marsha. The marsha says. Um, what what does God want to why, why does God want to create the world? It's because as we know, as the Medrash says in in uh, in, uh, in Medrash Tanchum and Pasha Shmini, the Gura elaborates on this in the beginning of his Pirish to uh, Yona. Once again, a very important growth. The purpose of the world is not for us to uh, through the world go into the beautiful world of paradise. No. The purpose of the world is to bring paradise into this world. The purpose of creation is to see one, to bring metaphysics into our reality. And that is, we are supposed to transform the world around us, making it a better world, a better world in multiple senses, bringing Shekhinah into this world. But we use the language of the, uh, uh, Kabbalah that Yechida Shebenefesh should be mayor in a group. And the ultimate end of history is going to be where the goofing will be. We're not going to, the idea of having the shamas up without a goof, according to the Balea Kabbalah, according to the Ramban, that's just like a waiting room in, in, in you know, in Penn Station. That's a, it's a nice waiting room. You're, you're in the club, I don't know, you're in whatever club you are in the airport, you know what I mean? Depends which club you're in. Okay, that's something else. Yeah, you're platinum, you're very good, they give you a nice service. But it's a, that's 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 the oil on the shamans. That's not the end of reality. In reality, everything has to come back down to this world. The difference is the world will be different, as we discussed multiple times. World is a level of consciousness. The most, the total oneness of God will be expressed in all of creation. That's how you will live. You have a different language, different understandings of reality, as we discussed in the past. Reality depends on what you internalize and how you interpret. If you recall, we discussed that. We can live in subjective worlds. Yeah, so there's going to be a different world. That's the ultimate goal of creation. Not to go up to heavens, but bring the heaven into earth. It's called, He wants to reside totally at lower levels of consciousness, which have raised themselves. Why he wants it, I don't care less, but that's what he wants. Okay, this is what we have. Once we understand that, so what does that mean? He wants to be realized by the pygmies. Equals, he needs a duality and wants to be realized by the pygmies. Great. That's called being a king. What does a king mean? We discussed this also in the past. A king means that who embodies your national identity and you see themselves and your history and your culture and your language embodied in that persona. 
like the typical Englishman at the time, saw Elizabeth as embodying his nation, his identity. Uh, they even thought that Diana was to a certain extent. Okay, I don't know what they feel today about Charles and Camilla. I have no idea. I've been there for a while. But uh, Elizabeth definitely had, was embodied that idea. Uh, there was a certain, there was a certain respect to the flag. This idea, this expresses my national and my history. I'll never forget going to the Tower of London many years ago with my eldest two boys. They were still very young, and you know, you see all the different tortures of reality that happened there through history. And I remember my son asking me, "Abe, lomid b'shim." Like, are they ashamed to tell their this? This is no. That's who they are. The story of the monarchy and, and, and the intrigue of monarchy is the story of England. That's, just, that's who you are, okay? You can decide to be ashamed of who you are. No, they're very healthily, that's who they are. The, the monarchy is them. When God wants to be a king, equals I want to be perceived in a lower level of reality and brought there into their domain. The king wants to live amongst his serfs with the serfs totally uh, living with him consciously. That's what he wants. So Anna Emlech means I want to create a fractured world in which they will all somehow see me. This is a Ramban at the end of this last week's parsha. if you recall. Top the Ramban writes literally the end of the Ramban, that the double reason of creation, all of Torah and Mitzvahs, is to create a reality where the human being will recognize that he's nothing more than a created form of God and will live by that, if we ask to that, will live by that idea. That idea will define his reality. Yodel kach doesn't mean to thank him, it means to admit, to live totally without it. Can you imagine living with nothing more than understanding I am a created form of God's will? You wouldn't have, you wouldn't, your sense of self would be like Hillel's. Hillel says, the Gemara and Sukkot, Imani Khan, Hakol Khan, which sounds like he's flipping his suspenders, and Rashi means I need the name of God. I, I equals God. If God is here, I am here. I, when you just said I, yes, I and God are one. I am nothing more than a vehicle of God's wisdom and will, and I'm to bring that realization to being, and that's what's called a need. That's the ultimate goal. The goal is that. Therefore, that's the idea of God created with you. I know Emlech. Now, what? That's Melech. So the Rutzen of Bria. In one word is Melech. Now, it says that there's, uh, what did Bilaam do? So he brings a Medrash to Marsha. He wanted to take the letters Melech, Mem, and Lamed, Chaf, to make them, flip them, to make them to Chaf, Lamed, Mem, which means Kalein, destroy them. There's one minute where God, in the day, which God has Harain Af, which he's angry because people aren't doing what he wants to do. And what the Marsha explains, what he does, he holds the tongue of God out metaphorically, flipping the word Melch, wanting the world to be, to deciding to give up. Kalein, destroy them. And God, and that's exactly where God didn't let them happen. It's a very interesting Marsha, in Sanhedrin. So the idea behind is, yes, the, the will of creation is basically the will of wanting to be a king, which means a sense of duality, means a sense of... Uh, Hester upon him, misconstruing, and, this, and the capability of going up and doing the opposite. So that's the idea when he says, Makshava Akhaz of Anna M. Life is the beginning of the world. So now he writes further in the, I'll flip the page to page 356 on the second line. We talk about the ideas of level of consciousness, which are metaphysics and beyond our uh, uh, basic understanding, therefore they're not revealed to us. Shaheem Savu. Their creation was not really expressed. There was no yehi there. It was only there because God thought it. The world of metaphysics. All of levels of consciousness were that way in the very beginning. In other words, originally, when God thought of everything in Oisius and Mechshava, Everything was totally in oneness with him, and there was no sense of independence. To allow them to come to a lower level of consciousness, shame as they are today, in the levels of consciousness which are revealed and we experience. Yes, by speech, he gave it a sense of externality and independence. 
כמו שכתוב, בדבר השם, מים נעשו, ויהי אור, אין היא, ויאמר ויהי אור. נמצא, let's we sum up, על ידי בחינת מחשבה, by the osir, by the דיבר שבלב, נברו, אלמנט סתימים ולא יסגליון, those levels of kind are comprehension, I would call the level of metaphysics of reality, by the דיבר אוידברך, when he spoke, metaphorically speaking that he gave it independence and a sense of self there's a world that we're trying to happen so we now have learned one thing uh, this is very important there is I would say the word Bereshit which is Almin de Iskasian means the uh, means the, meta- the metaphysics of reality the beginnings of reality and then there is the creation of the world we know what, which is basically the test mama wrote This is, fits with the Ramban very beautifully, but I think it's much more profound than just, just reading primary matter. We're talking about a reality a level, which has no sense of independence. That is the difference between Machshavah's Isis and Machshavah and Isis and Okay, we're going to hear already, we can understand that before Nivra Ha'ilam means the Bria of Ha HaDibur. But in the Bria of Ha'ilam HaMachshavah, also Bria, There, there is, Yud Kei Yes, of course, there's a sense of duality, but there is a reality. There's me, and there's something there. Just, it has no way of being misconstrued. I'll say, I have me, and I have me and my thoughts. If I want to describe me and my thoughts, I'll say, oh, you're the thinker. So I'm going to describe me and my thoughts equals I am called Yud Kei That's what the word thinker here means. Yeah, Yud Kei means God the thinker. Okay, the God the thinker is called God Yud Okay, Bob, okay. okay, I think that should be enough for today. We will continue this. The next thing is very interesting. You say every Friday, Hashem Allah, he wears his Gaiba suit. He didn't hear in Musr, in the Yeshiva, he didn't go to, he didn't hear, what do you mean? God's about Gaiba. Hashem Allah, God, he was, a, was a king, he wears his Gaiba suit. Okay? What kind of thing is this? Why is he about Gaiba? And we even praised him by saying he's a Balgaiva, right? What do you mean? Geirut Levesh. He, he engarmented himself in Gaiva, which he totally encompassed himself in. Ich bin du, I'm here. What does that mean? Okay, that's a serious question. That's exactly the following topic, which is coming up immediately now. This is in the Simon base. We'll start doing that in the uh, whenever the time comes, which is two weeks from now. Have a great week. I love you all. Have a good Tushima, uh, Tubishvat, I mean, yeah. Have a good Tobi Shvat. And Bracha uh, Vatzlacha. Bye. Take care. Great seeing you all again. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you, Rebbe. Thank you, Rebbe. Bye. Bye.